Hello。Squash and stretch is all wrong, so I'm I'm gonna make a video about it because I'm unemployed and I don't have anything better to do. <laughs>、um, so, twelve principles of animation is like pretty much the first thing. Anyone who is vaguely interested in animation learns, and and the the list goes from one to twelve, and they're in order. There's an order to this list. It's always the same order. It's squat and they straight ahead. Follow our second goal. Appeal. That's the twelve principle principles of animation. People look at it and go, okay, that makes sense. But the more I look at it, the less sense it makes. It it doesn't. What is the order here? And and like anyone who does animation knows that this is not all there is. Where's spacing? I mean, I guess spacing is in slow in and slow out. That's spacing. I guess you could say that spacing is like universal. Like you can't avoid having spacing. Like if you're gonna put drawings one next to another, you're gonna have spacing.、You、can't avoid that. So maybe it's like not a principle. But then why is timing there? Because I feel like. Timing and spacing are like the same thing. Well, not the same thing, but like different, this different sides of the same coin. Like if you create timing, then you're gonna make spacing. If you create spacing, then you're gonna make timing. So, like, what? Why is this order like this? And like, what is appeal? What is appeal? What do you mean appeal? Just. Um, the twelve principles were、uh, popular in this book, and this might be the first time that they're shown into like the public. But basically, it's like a list of animation principles by、um, Disney animators,、um, just to remind the animators on what's important. So, like you know, like if you have a like post-it notes, you might have post-it notes on your you know computer. Monitor that says, "Don't forget to do this. Save your work. Go buy eggs from the store."、Um, that's what Twelve Principles is. It's not law, and it's not even that scientific. Or like, it, they haven't like. I don't feel like it's that complete. They haven't even attempted to make like a full list. Even in Illusion of Life, they have like. At least two other lists of, of principles that they、uh, include in the book. They have、uh, Fred Moore's has like fourteen principles, and then、uh, Ollie and Frank Thomas. Oh, well, they're not married. <laughs> the more I found out about their past history together, it becomes more and more extraordinary. And I guess it's kind of an enigma to me because I'm not that close to somebody. I mean, to a male friend. Me, I can't figure out what it is that fuels it. What is it that gives it life?、Um, that's the mystery of love, I suppose. So, well, they're not married. <laughs> Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas—they create、um, another set of principles simply based on、um, uh, Bill Titler's work. And so, like, you can have different lists of principles, and I think that's really under- important to understand that you should have your own subjective list of. Principles, because that's what the twelve principles is. That said, all the other lists that you see on the illusion of life, for example, are really weird. Well, not weird, but they're abstract. They're like wishy-washy. They're they they have things like、uh, have, make sure you convey emotion or something. It's like what what do you mean? That doesn't mean anything.、Um, it, like yeah, of course I'm gonna convey emotion. I I mean I'm gonna try. So the twelve principles is really technical. It's like one of the more technical, well, or it's probably the most technical list because like they're all kind of practical things that are on the list aside from like appeal. What the? F- so, so I think that's why because of the technicality and really the simplicity of the list is why it is the list that everybody knows of animation principles. But the order makes no sense, and I and and I think it's supposed to be in order of importance. It's not like in order of fundamentality. Like you know, like if that was the case, then timing would be one. 
right? Because timing would be the most important thing, but it's not. Um, so it's probably in the order of like just importance of like, if you are going to forget one thing on this list, you better not forget squash and stretch. And squash and stretch is actually the one I want to talk about here because people look at it and they go, um, yeah, yeah, squashing and stretching. You have a ball and it goes like that's squash and stretching. And, and then they leave it at that. And, and that's wrong. <laughs> that's dumb. <laughs> You're a dummy. You're an idiot. I hate you. I, uh, I actually prefer animated survival kit. I don't have it here um, because uh, somebody gave it to me as a PDF years and years ago, and I haven't had the need to buy it. So I don't have it here, but I would bring it up if I did, which I feel like it's shameful to say, but also whatever. Um, Richard Williams actually starts with like timing and spacing and just flat out says like, if you take everything out of animation, then you're going to have timing and spacing. Like that's, you can't have animation without timing and spacing. Like if you put images one after another and play them rapidly, then you're going to find timing and spacing there. Even if the balls just go like this or whatever, you know, it's still going to have timing and spacing. So, so timing and spacing are just fundamental and unavoidable. Maybe you want to put posing in with timing and spacing so the three things that you can't avoid are timing, spacing, and posing. If we think of posing in terms of like creating things, like I have to make a guy to animate, you know, I have to draw the guy and drawing that guy includes everything that, in that goes into drawing a little guy. And so, uh, that's that's basically what posing is, um, and so you have you have timing, spacing, and posing. And uh, to illustrate this, he does the coin exercise uh, in the book, which is amazing, and everybody should do, because you, that you don't have any other control than moving the coin. And then he shows this with um, the bouncing ball exercise, which uh, is really nice and simple. It's just a bouncing ball, and it looks nice. From there, he gets into um, squash and stretch like he should, because once you do timing and spacing a bouncing ball and nothing else, you realize that you're not really conveying what the material of the ball is. Like you can slow it down and speed it up and reduce the amount of bounce and recoils and whatever, and you will communicate how heavy the ball is, but you're still kind of lacking that material something from the ball. And so he then says, uh, you can use squash and stretch to uh, illustrate um, what the ball is like. And then he shows this picture. And I hate this picture. This is, I, I hate it. Here's the same picture on Illusion of Life. I hate it. It sucks. This is a god awful illustration of squash and stretch. Like, what is going on here? What is squash and stretch? If we're going to go back and do like caveman analysis on squash and stretch, imagine like animators in the 1900s are like, like early humans and, and we have no knowledge of them. And we can, but we can still kind of imagine how they can come about squash and stretch, right? Because they're humans. So, so we can imagine a 1900s animator being like, well, I'm a human and I know that some things are squishy. A floppy ball is squishy. Uh, and I know that some things are hard and, and, and those are not squishy, they're rigid. And so it has squishy objects and rigid objects. But there's also rigid objects that are kind of squishy or like, like I can squish them, but once I do, they recoil back. They're like, Elastic things and elastic things are bouncy things, right? So I'm an animating this ball bouncing, and I'm pretty sure it's a bouncing ball because it bounces, and 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 so I know that it's because it's kind of squishy that once it hits the ground, it squishes, and I also know that because it's a uh, elastic thing, once it squishes one way, it will recoil the other way, and so that's a stretch. So I know, so I know I have this ball that that's coming down. And it 
squishes on the ground and then it stretches up and then bounces again and 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 then squishes again on the ground and then how you, that's how you get squash and stretch or i guess i kept saying squish and stretch uh, but that's squash and stretch right and so now what now that this caveman animator has reminded himself to actually like like squash the ball like properly make the drawing that is squashed because it's easy to be like well it squashes so fast that you can't even see it right and you think of a golf ball or tennis ball or something oh it just squashes so fast and you know, why should i draw it but w once the animator actually figures like does the thing and that you know squashes the ball then then they will realize that that wow yeah it really sold the bounciness of this ball so that's like the most simple squash and stretch right like it's just uh, material objects squash and stretch. When you apply force to an object, the force being uh, the gravity is pulling the ball, and then uh, when it hits the ground, the ground pushes up on the ball, and and, and then that deforms the ball. Like once you once you know that, then then you can like communicate better on what the ball is. So squash and stretch is. Squash and stretch is is material deformation or something like that. So if you look up back at this image, it's kind of bad. Can you like you see here on this part? Like why is it stretching here? Like what is happening? Why does it? become an egg before it hits the ground like what is if bo if squashing and stretching is the result of like physics like the force being applied to this ball that causes a stretch what is stretching in here like you want to say oh it's uh, air resistance it's drag right the ball is falling through air and as and as the air is like escapes and goes around the ball it like it grabs onto the sides of the ball and stretches it out like a person who's skydiving, right? Their cheeks go like, like you want to say that's that, but, but it's not that, right? Because if if a ball was so flimsy and flippy floppy and flubby that it would get stretched by such a small and slow moving amount of air, then how could it have the structural integrity to actually bounce off, right? Like, either this thing is, like, comically light, like it's super light, it's like a soap bubble, right? And then it hits the ground and bounces off, but then the trajectory wouldn't be that. And I don't think people think about soap bubbles when they think of this. They think of just a generic bouncing ball, like a basketball or tennis ball or something like that. And so, so either it's super light or it's, like, dough. Like it's like a wet dough, and if it's a wet dough, then it's not gonna bounce. It's just gonna on the ground. So, so like, what what is this? Why are we why are we showing this stretch here? Because you're gonna have people now thinking, oh, it's like you know, it's gonna be stretched into a pizza when you know, when when it falls because air drag, and so just squash and stretch, right? So it's not that. And so, so why? What is going on here? Like you see this picture in every single animation book. Like it's the same picture where the ball starts stretching right before impact. Like how is that possible? Like these books are written by like animation legends. How is it possible that that? What? Why? Like are they are they idiot? Is he dumb? Is he dumb? Are they idiots? They're probably not idiots, so the so let's figure out what the fuck squash and stretch is. Part two is smears a squash and stretch. Um, you've probably seen on Twitter. I'm not calling it X. Um, you've probably seen on Twitter. Um, somebody posted a picture of Homer Simpson turning, and Homer has like ten eyes like this. And then they go, look at this bad drawing. Of course, they're just baiting you, but you know, they go, look at this very bad drawing. It's always bad. Um, and that's what smears are. 
you know, you know this. They're animation smears, and they're not bad, right? They're an animation trick, right? The thing is that smears are not stretches. They're smears. Um, smears. Smears. Um, they're not stretches. They're smears. And smears, they, the difference between a smear and a stretch is that <laughs> is is that when I stretch something, like I'm maintaining its structural integrity, right? As best as it can, right? So if I stretch a ball, the volume of the ball is not changing, or the, well, the volume is changing. The mass of the ball is not changing, right? We still have the same amount of mass. So when we stretch things in animation, we want to respect the volumes is what we have, what we in the industries that we we want to respect the volume. So when a swallow squashes, right, like let's say it flattens this much downwards, then it's going to like spread equal amount sideways, right, to maintain the amount of stuff that is in there. So stretches maintain volumes. And smears don't maintain volumes. They don't respect volumes because smears are not actually, um, they don't show what is actually happening. They're an optical trick. They're motion blur, right? Okay. The reason why smears don't maintain volume is because um, it's just uh, sh it's just showing the path of the thing that it's tra that the object is tra traveling through, right? Does that make sense? It's it's motion blur. Have you ever considered what motion blur is, or like the reverse of that, like? Why are like what does it mean for things to be sharp in video? Like why is why am I sharp here? Like what what is what is a frame in a video? So a video camera is basically like an eye, right? It's a camera that blinks a lot, so it's like an eye that blinks a lot, right? So when its eyes open, it's recording the light and it's saving that light, and then and then it closes its eye and, and and then moves the next image to be recorded, and then it opens the eye again. And, and does that a lot in a second. And uh, so when something is traveling so fast that w during that moment when the eyes open, uh, it actually manages to travel a significant distance, right? So you have an eye blinking and then something's moving so fast that it actually managed to go from here to here during the opening of an eye. That thing becomes blurry because the open eye of the camera is recording all the lights from all the points that the object has been in. And I think that's kind of cool. Like. I think it's cool that things are sharp in video because like a, a, a picture that is motion blurry and a picture that is sharp are still the same thing. Like they're, they're made up of the same process. Like the process doesn't change. Like the camera doesn't see a subject that is still and then say, I'm going to focus on that. The camera just gets what it gets. And so it's kind of, fun to think about how like even sharp things in film are just motion blur like it's all motion blur but it's just that the things happen to stay still during the opening of the eye enough that that all the light that was recorded during that thing is are like you know they average out into something that's sharp and so motion blur is also just averaging out of a motion but it's you know covering greater area on the camera eye than than the size of the object on the oh my god okay <sighs> anyways and I think it's just a side note I think it's important and this comes back becomes relevant later uh, is that the amount of time that the eye is open you know the camera eye when it's blinking the amount of time that it's open is not the frame rate of the video I feel like, like this is probably obvious to most but it's not the fr frame rate of the video. So uh, if you want to think of like a machine, like a simple machine, of course, video cameras are more complex these days. But a simple machine version of a camera is you have the eye that records it and you have an eyelid that goes in front of the eye uh, at a period. So it's blinking. And then behind the eye, you have the film that is that is actually like 
collecting all the light that the eye is recording. And every time the eye closes, a new piece of film moves behind the eye. And, and the rate at which a piece of film moves and is replaced and just you know cycles in and out, that's the frame rate of the video. So, so you know, 30 times a second, 24 times a second, a new piece of film will come behind the eye to be recorded light, right? But then within that like 24th of a second, there's also another fraction of a second when the eye is open, right? Because that 30th of the second is made up of the time that the eyelid is closed, but also the time that the eyelid is open. And the time that the eyelid is open is how, mon how much time there is for the eye to record light, right? So the film moving in is frame rate, but the time that the eye is open is called exposure, exposure time or shutter speed. And so the greater our exposure time, the slower our shutter speed. Um, the more time there is for things to become blurry, right? Like the more the eye is open, the slower something has to move for it to become motion blurry. And this is important and interesting for animation because what is the exposure time of animation? We don't, we just have frame rate. We don't have exposure time. And so how do we decide when to smear things, when to use motion blur? I think this is really interesting because like, if we think about animation done in full frame, and if you don't know, a full frame is like every frame in a second is used up in, as an animation drawing. Every frame is a new animation drawing. So if you think of a ball uh, going across the screen in one second, there it's on every frame of that second, there's a ball in a new position. But with this, we like even when we animate full frame, we're using all the possible data that we have to do animation. We still have spacing, which is like if you think, like spacing is not a real thing, right? Like it's not like we don't have spacing in reality. Things just move, right? And so, but in animation, when we do moving in one in twenty four frames per second, we get spacing between our like movements. And so what what is the empty space between two drawings in animation at full frame? Like when we used up all our frames, why are our frames where they're where they are? Like if I think of two poses like just three frames for um ball moving right and we have two two drawings here and we haven't drawn the in between in, in the middle here why does the ball go here in the middle and not here towards one or the other or the other because like if i put the ball in the middle i still have space to draw the ball in other places so what is this in between that we've created what what is spacing and and what it is is that it's it's the average right like like if if the motion between these two frames is even right then the ball that we draw in between them is just is just the centered average of all those balls if the movement between these two frames was slowing down or speeding up, so if you think about it in terms of spacing, right, the drawings get tighter and tighter, then we would draw our ball closer uh, to one of the other balls, right? But but in even even in those cases, what we're drawing is just the average, right? Because every time we think of a spacing, we could always just keep adding more spacing, right? Does this make sense? Is this not insane? So what are we doing when we're actually creating drawings? Like, what are we saying when we say that this pose happens on this frame? Why is it that pose in that frame? Like, you can't, like, if I have an action character doing an action, I'm losing my mind right now, uh, live on air. Um, 
if you have like if your pose happens in a certain time, why is it exactly that pose in that exact time? Well, the answer is that it's not. It's just an averaging of all the possible minute variations of that pose that could happen in that one twenty fourth of a frame, and that's really important for a human vision. Not a lot happens in twenty four, like in the twenty fourth of a second. But things do happen in the 24th of a second. And we have to decide, okay, out of all these possible options. Out of all these possible options, what is the one that we do? And we instinctively do the average one, right? And so when we think about smears, we're just doing, we're just increasing the average that we're showing, right? Like. Like take these two balls and the ball that's in the middle of them. There's all these potential drawings here in like steel that could have existed. And if we smear something, it's just gonna like borrow from those hypothetical drawings and expand itself, right? It's motion blur. By motion blur, we're showing the average light that got bounced from an object during its trajectory. Okay, sorry for that tangent. <laughs> I, I don't know, I lost my mind. Um, going back to when do we swear? So swear. When do we smear? Uh, we smear. We can do an experiment uh, with uh, with the ball again. So, if I lay out a track, a timing spacing chart on a paper, and I say this timing and spacing is gonna stay the same throughout this entire experiment, and we're gonna add a ball there, and the ball is gonna move according to the timing and spacing chart. Uh, and as the experiment goes on, I'm going to change the size of the ball. So at, at first it's very big and it goes through the timing and spacing chart and it looks very smooth. And as I keep making the ball smaller and smaller, and it will start moving faster. It, it will look like it's going faster because it's, it's traveling more distance in relation to the size of the object, right? That's why, like, a big thing moving very fast in a distance will look like it's moving slowly because it's not covering much of its own distance, right? And so as the ball gets really slow, uh, really small, it starts to go really fast. And at some point it starts to go so fast and it starts, <laughs> um, at some point it starts uh, going so fast that it actually becomes disjointed. Like it kind of, the movement starts to break down because the ball is going so fast, it's traveling such a long distance per frame that that it looks like it's skipping, like it's teleporting, like it's no longer connected. Um, and that, when that starts to happen, uh, we can use smears. So instead of drawing a, you know, a ball, we do a smear. And that smear represents all the positions that the ball, the, the, the ball is in uh, during that 1 24th of a second. And we do that, and we have motion, motion blur, we have a smear, and, and we've fixed the problem of skipping because for some, when something goes too fast. Um, it's not just a utility thing. Smearing is also, and maybe even more importantly, part of the shared language of animation. It's just a convention. We understand that when something is smeared, it's going fast. That's just like a smear can be pretty slow, and the audience still goes, "Okay, I'm supposed to think that this is fast." And so, like maybe the audience goes, "Okay, this is like subjective time thing, where it's like we have a smear, but I could see the smear, so it's not that fast." And um, but okay, but it's still fast. It's a, it's a communication thing. It's a design thing. It's not just utility. Um, uh, Richard Williams uses a smear in his book, and he actually doesn't call it a smear, and I think it's wrong. Like in his book later on, he starts to speak about um, elongated in betweens as a way of smear, uh, talking about smears. But uh, that comes after this example that I'm going to show you. But this example is definitely a smear. It's not a stretch. He calls it he calls it a stretch. So, but it's a great example. It's an example about how to get more impact into well, an impact. How to get a better, more impactful punch or a 
bonk or something. And it's an example of a coyote, you know, probably being shot from a can cannon or something, you know, flying at a wall. And and Richard Williams' like first instinct for this thing, or at least in this example, is to you know, uh, draw the coyote flying at an even pace. And then when the head is at a touching distance from the wall, he just draws on that frame the coyote being uh, like smooshed against the wall. And that's um, Richard Williams' first instinct for doing that. And I think I think he's doing it intentionally badly. Um, he shows that Ken Harris then corrects him, or I don't know if Ken Harris did, but something like he shows a correction to this. So instead of just right away jumping to the impact where the coyote is like smooshed, you draw the head making contact with the wall, but not drawing, you know, the body transforming yet. So you get the contact without the weight distribution, and that way you get better communication for what's happening. Um, and that's that's totally right. And then Richard Williams shows, shows the trick. So the trick is that you remove um, you remove the last two frames right before impact, and you replace those two frames with an elongated version of the coyote that that spans the distance of you know those two poses, and that's a smear. That's not a stretch, because you're not respecting the volumes anymore. You just, you know, you're fully breaking the coyote. It's, it's, it's a smear. Um, of course, it's not a, like a smeary smear, like the way that Homer Simpson's Ten Eyes would be, right? Or like, you know, a sword swing where it's like just an, like a cone that comes up. But but it's still a smear. And and this makes the impact a lot stronger. Um, because, like, of course it does, because you're covering the distance of two frames in one frame. You're skipping ahead, you're creating a skip, but then you fix it with a smear. That's a smear. And Richard William talked about a stretch. Um, so I think he's implying that it's part of squash and stretch. And he is actually implying that that's squash and stretch because he takes this example on to the bouncing ball then. To Richard Williams' credit, in the beginning when I said that this is a horrible image, uh, Richard Williams also agrees that it's it's a very fringe case image. And so so he's not surprisingly a total dum-dum. But he takes this, this coyote example and then brings it to the bouncing ball example, precisely pointing out that there's a lot of squash and stretch here. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, there's too much squash and stretch. And he does this whole page on that premise, and then he never he never touches the squash and stretch. He just... He just talks about contact. Like, the contact point. He doesn't address the squashing and stretching right before impact, right before contact. Why? <laughs> Why, Richard? I... That's upsetting. Um, so what is going on here? But we now have the tools to understand what's going on here. This ball st is stretching here because it's a smear. Right? It's not stretching because the mass is being deformed. It's being stretched because it's smear. The ball is going faster, and so we're going to merge that, those drawings of the ball with some of the other drawings that could be surrounding it, and we create a smear. And so by doing that, we communicate to the audience the ball is going fast, and we also help them to see the directionality of the ball because we're showing the path that it's going to go to and not just the path that, that it was in. It's a smear doesn't like lack behind a ball. It, it spreads from the front forward-facing bit and the backward-facing bit both ways because it's an average out, averaging out of all the frames that are in between that could be in between. 
So it's a smear. And because this is part of squash and stretch in every single goddamn squash and stretch thing, smears are squash and stretch. So we can do squash and stretch by deforming the object, you know, the material of the object, and thinking about the physics of it. That's squash and stretch. And we can think about the speed of the object in relation to the quote-unquote exposure time, and that's also squash and stretch, or it's well, a stretch, but then in relation, because it's a stretch, then there has to be a squash in relation as well. Um, maybe you can imagine, like, character moving sideways really fast. Maybe that's a squash, like a motion speed squash. Mm. But but anyway, so we have material squash and stretch, and we have motion squash and stretch. And that's it, right? Well, you also have posing, like posing squash and stretch is also a thing. So. After the bouncing ball example in Animated Survival Kit, there's a great example of how the bouncing ball is used to animate really anything. Um, there's an example of this person jumping, which follows the principles of, of a bouncing ball. The, the ball, but here, the stretch that is happening before impact is more intentional. It, it's not motion blur, it's the person stretching their legs out to take contact with the ground. So squash and stretch, you know, applies to posing as well. It applies to just people and characters, animals. It, like, and it's not because in this drawing it's it's like like a like a like an egg man. It's not because of that. It's like we could do the same thing with a skeleton. Like, if a skeleton puts arms up its head, above its head, straight up, he's stretching now, right? Like this is a stretch. And then if it go, goes like this. This is a squash, right? It's it's squashing up, you know. It's if it does a little crab walk, then it's a it's a it's a squash, and so this is something that I think every like artist realizes. And I mean, it's also taught in like anatomy class and stuff like that. Like when we bend like this, we get a squash here and a stretch here. But this is the material stuff, right? This is the same one as the first kind of squash and stretch. But then we also just have squash and stretch in terms of like this is a squash. This is a stretch, right? And and yeah, I feel like that's pretty obvious. I don't like I just spent so much time talking about smears and now I'm just like, yeah, okay, but poses as well. And that's it. End of the story. Poses. Yeah, you can you can you can squash and stretch with poses. But I don't think that's all of it. And this is my, this is a very, um, uh, this is a radical claim. But I think you can do squash and stretch with just like rigid ob objects, just totally rigid objects. Like once, because like you want to think like, okay, humans can squash and stretch because we have joints, right? Like it's the, like I can fold my joints into a ball so that I become kind of squashed or I can uh, like open them up and I become stretched. I think, that's not all of it. I mean, that's for human posing. That's definitely what it is. But I think if we were just an arm bone, if, we was, if I was, you know, if I was just, you know, a stick, I feel like I could still do squash and stretch. Because, well, okay. I'm going to show an example on from uh, Cyberpunk Edge Runner, Edge Runners. This scene is really fun because the, the animator does something with the guns here that's that I think is really cool. Um, and I would classify it as question stretch. I know I've already gotten pushback on that, but, but I'm going to stick and stand my ground. Uh, I will never learn. Uh, I will never uh, admit fault. So when the guy, I don't remember his name, like... When he right before he gets into the into the car, he stretches himself up as in anticipation of like going into the car, and that's obviously a stretch, right? But with the gun, he kind of turns it perpendicular to himself uh, or like upwards, and it creates really nice visual contrast. Like not only is there utility for the acting, right? He's like blocking bullets or something. It's also just like really nice visual contrast between like the guy stretching out and then the gun kind of blocking that energy or redirecting it. And then 
when the guy gets into the car, he kind of squashes, not kind of, he very much squashes. But then he creates a stretch with the gun by by reorientating it uh, like ninety degrees. And and I would say that the gun here is actually experiencing its own squash and stretch. The gun is used as in like an interplay to uh, influence the squashing and stretching of the guy. And it's always like in contrast to the guy. So when the guy is stretched, the gun is squashed. And when the guy is squashed, the gun is stretched. And I think in that regard, the gun experiences its own squash and stretch. And right in the next car, the same thing happens again. Um, here maybe uh, a little differently. Uh, the girl also falls in the, in the gun and then she leans on the gun and the gun is like perfectly vertical. And like that's also amazing because it's like blocking all the energy that, that is coming from the girl falling over, right? It's like a wall of like, and it creates this nice little tension. And, and in my original notes, I actually wrote that the gun here is having a stretch when it's vertical. But I actually think this is a squash <laughs> uh, because, because it's like you can feel the compressive energy on this gun in, in lengthwise, right? Like, and, 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 and that feels very squashy. Like it, nothing's happening to the gun, but because it's like this is like a uh, Canada school, like like really strong orientation changes and whatever it it feels like it's it's squashing and then when the the girl takes the proper pose with the gun like she's kind of like it, it feels stretchy like it feels like it's like like the opposite energy of the squash that happened earlier and i feel like like this kind of orientation tricks are enough to justify being squash and stretch because they get the point of squash and stretch across which is um like if you think of a ball right like it's the stretching of the ball according to one axis and then as a recoil it stretches the other way like that's always what squash and stretch is we have we have change of we have deformation in one way and then a response to that deformation in another way. And these gun plays here that is happening in this scene feel very squash and stretchy, even though nothing is actually squashing and stretching. They're rigid objects. Um, like I can think of other things like like if I think of a like a character doing a kickflip. Not, not a kickflip, but, but some kind of flip where the board goes vertical and spins. I'm not a skateboarder. I don't know. When I think of that, Right, the board is going like this, and then just flip and goes like this, and then like this is a stretch. This feels like a stretch. Like we're changing, we're just changing the orientation of the board. That feels like a stretch. Like I know I'm just vibing here. Like it's not like I can't really justify this. It feels like it's a stretch. But I, I don't know. I feel like a tree, you know. <laughs> you know, you have a tree. That's like a stretch, right? And then when you cut the tree down, uh, that's a squash, <laughs> right? Like I feel like I'm losing my mind, but but this feels right because, like, when I think of squash and stretch, it's what it really is is visual contrast. It's a change in shape. It's shape contrast. Squash and stretch. Like, if we go back to thinking what the 12 principles even are, they're reminders, right? They're reminding us to keep these things in check. And so what is squash and stretch reminding us? Well, it's reminding us that one, materials deform, just the deformation of materials. Two, uh, speed stretches and deforms things as well, optically. And three, uh, use the squashy and stretchy qualities of posing so covering stretching spreading wide use those to those feelings about those posing like lean into the squashy quality of a squat or something you know 
it's a reminder to pay attention to those qualities of you know animation and that's what it does and so so all of what what combines all of these in my opinion is 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 visual change over time shape change over time and and that feels like that's what squash and stretch actually is and if we think about squash and stretch as like uh like emphasizing contrast shape contrast then it's very similar to something like anticipation right like and if you think about anticipation so much of it is squash and stretch like imagine a cannonball is flying at a character like you do the anticipation trick of like going down shooting up and then screaming right like that's anticipation of the thing and that's just squash and stretch right like if you gotta jump up you gotta squat down before you can stretch out right like that's squash and stretch and so anticipation and squash and stretch have, have a lot of common and i like in my brain i treat these two as like part of the same like like category of like the animation principles that deal with uh, visual contrast um, or communicating like shape contrast or visual contrast. It's the same with, in, in the same category, you also have staging. So like if staging is the principle of just like framing things in a way that they're clear as day. So if I was to stage myself like an animator right now talking, a really dumb pose you know so as you can see the silhouette of the microphone if i'm like this you can't even see the microphone in the silhouette so that's like poor staging it doesn't read well uh, and so so that's like like the most general visual conscious thing you can do is like just make your drawings clear it's kind of like solid drawing again maybe even appeal what is appeal we don't know um it's like it's like that again if anticipation is relation is the subject relating to the outside world, then uh, squash and stretch is just the subject and its relation to itself. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, that's squash and stretch. And I think you understand. Like, I hope you now see why this is a like like what I like. This is what I'm, this is what I mean when I say that it's like horribly miscommunicated and like misunderstood well not horribly but you know it's like it's not greatly explained like people just show this picture of bouncing balls and say this is squash, squash and stretch and like i never see anybody elaborate on this further it's just bouncing ball but that's not what it is and like i uh... <laughs> making this video i'm um slightly inspired by a collier astro um and she has a video called jail man amnesia um jail man amnesia is like a co cognitive bias or a relapse in judgment um that we have when we read the read the news so if you ever read a newspaper, but I mean, you can imagine yourself reading a newspaper or scrolling Twitter or something, and you come cr come across um, a subject, an article on a subject that you're familiar with, for me it would be like, I don't know, animation. And I read the article and I go, that's not right. That's not right. And I realize how badly the article is written and how it's like all wrong, basically. And I go, well, that sucked. And then I go to the next page, read an article about like foreign politics or something, and I just note along to it being like, yeah, 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 no, this is right. Like totally forgetting the fact that that if the previous article that I knew something about was totally wrong, why should I trust that the next article is right? Right? Like we just ignore that observation. We forget all the skepticism that we maybe should have. Um, and in relation to this, she comes up with the reverse of this, the flip side of 
gel man amnesia, which is which she calls man gel amnesia. Um, and that is the observation that when we teach something to people, like a difficult subject, which animation is not, but like when you teach physics or mathematics or something, specifically physics to somebody or economics or something, in order to explain a difficult concept, it is beneficial to omit information or even give outright outdated or wrong information in the beginning so so that this the the student learns what you know what they have to learn so like if you think about like like atoms and electrons right you know the the thing where it's like you have the nucleus and then you have the electrons around it right and they're all like like that's not what an electron is but we we learn it that way because it's a very good way of teaching interactions between uh, things um, but it's wrong and it's fine that it's wrong because we can later on if that student goes on to learn physics they will one day they will be in a class or open a book that says hey this is wrong by the way and then they go okay it's wrong okay i will i accept this new one and with that in mind experts will still go and read articles and go, hmm, that's not quite right. Like they know that the article probably has to dumb things down and make things wrong in order to communicate the message better. But still they go, hmm, I would do this differently. Hmm. Like that's man gel amnesia. It's forgetting that in order to explain a concept, you got to kind of, you know, dumb it down a little. And I feel like I may be committing into a man gel amnesia here by complaining about squash and stretch not being communicated clearly enough like like you don't need to do other than that it's just squashing and stretching like because like once you start actually studying movement and subjects and posing you will come across the fact that oh you can find squashing and stretching everywhere so maybe i'm committing like a cognitive thing like bias thing here or like i uh, like an, not, i don't know if it's a fallacy but you know it doesn't I don't know, but like I'm just bothered that like this. I don't, I, I don't know a single source that fully actually talks about squash and stretch, like into the like to the full degree. Like maybe Walt Steinfeld's Drawn to Life, like like that book has a lot, of, a lot of like it has a lot of sections on squash and stretch, and and it has a lot of lists and you know all that stuff, and so maybe in there you can find a full collection of squash and stretch. And maybe you can find it in animation animator survival kin. But there's never really like a comprehensive like this is like like let's really think about it. Like what goes into squash and stretch and what, what are different reasons why things squash and stretch. And so that's why I made this video. Maybe it's super pedantic, but but I had like a squash and stretch psychosis yesterday and I just wrote like twenty pages. And so yeah, so squash and stretch is is squashing and squashing and stretching. Yeah.